still there. I want to take this time to thank you very much for joining me. And I'd like to invite you to stay with me for the next half hour, as together you and I will share and discuss the Word of God. My opening scripture is taken from the book of Psalms, the eighth chapter and the third through the ninth verses. When I look at the night sky and see the works of your fingers, the moon, the stars you have set in place, what are mortals that you think of us, mere humans that you should care for us? For you made us only a little lower than the angels, and you crowned us with glory and honor. You put us in charge of everything you made, giving us authority over all things, the sheep and the cattle, and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims the ocean currents. O oh Lord, our Lord, the majesty of your name fills the earth. And my second scripture is taken from the 118th Psalm, the 38th and 39th verses. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. And the title of my sermon today, I Don't Need Your Approval. You know, as you said in your lawyer's office, you were cognizant of your surroundings, but yet you found yourself in a mental paralysis. Everything seemed so surreal. Now, after your lawyer had completed his 15-minute discourse describing your unexpected financial windfall, your lawyer explained to you that an unidentified benevolent benefactor had set up a trust fund just for you that would guarantee that you would have financial independence for the rest of your life. And although the identity of your patron was never disclosed to you, yet your lawyer did say that your good fortune was the direct result of the good deeds you bestowed upon your benefactor when he was at his lowest point, both emotionally and financially. And your kind and encouraging words to him acted as a catalyst that helped him to turn his life around and he eventually became a billionaire. And he wanted to repay you for your kindness, sympathetic, and encouraging attitude toward him. And when the financial compensation was revealed to you, it far exceeded anything that you imagined. It went far beyond your wildest expectations. According to your trust fund, you are to receive a certified check in the amount of $1,440 every day for the rest of your life. Now, what, it made, what made it so unbelievable and wonderful was the fact that all of your taxes on the money that you receive will be paid in advance. This $1,440 was tax-free every day of your life. Yes, for the rest of your life, you would receive $1,440 tax-free. Now, this would come to $525,600 each year for the rest of your life. And it would be given to you, and you could use it at your own discretion. And once the shock of your good fortune began to wear off, you tried desperately to have your lawyer identify your patron saint, for you desperately wanted to thank him for the blessing he had bestowed upon you. 
for you thought that you would be eternally indebted to his kindness. But your lawyer remained steadfast in not revealing your benefactor's name, but he did make one concession. He gave you a post office box number where you could send your letters expressing your feelings, letters that eventually would reach your benefactor. And he, in turn, would know your feelings concerning your willingness to thank him for what he had done for you. And you made up your mind that each time that you received your check, you would send a card expressing your feelings of gratitude and appreciation for his wonderful gift to you. And initially, you were true to your word. Every day when the check would arrive, you would immediately send a thank you card expressing your gratitude. Now this went on for one month, three months, eight months, but then during the ninth month, you began to be a little lax in your appreciation. Instead of sending the cards every day, you began to send them in a sequence of three or four days. And after a year, they became more infrequent, coming maybe once a week. And after a year and a half, they were sent once a month. And after two years, they came perhaps once every three months. And after the fourth year, your thank you card was sent once a year. And as time would tell, that fervent fire of appreciation on your part began to wane. And you became complacent and unappreciative in your expression of gratitude toward your financial benefactor. You know, we as homo sapiens are very unique and peculiar creatures. It seems as if we can't stand too much of not only a bad thing, but also a good thing as well. And this truth is expressed to us in the 30th chapter of Proverbs and the 8th and 9th verses. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. For if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, Who is the Lord? And if I am too poor, I may steal and thus insult God's holy name. Now, what reason or reasons lies behind the spiritual metamorphosis that takes place in the lives of many people who become a financial recipient of a rags to riches story? Their personality undergoes a transformation in their spirit which goes from a submissive and humble spirit to one of arrogance, haughtiness, and a contempt for others. And these negative conditions are brought about by a very subtle and deceptive temptation, and it's known as the pride of life. And it's a condition which takes place in a person when the things of this world become more important than the things of God. And we are warned in 1 John, the second chapter, in the 15th through the 17th verses, that such a condition could be detrimental to one's spiritual growth in one's relationship with God. Stop loving this evil world and all that it offers you. For when you love the world, you show that you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only the lust for physical pleasure, the lust for everything we see, and pride in our possessions. These are not from the Father. They are from this evil world, and this world is fading away along with everything it craves. But if you do the will of God, you will live forever. 
And when you continue to allow pride to become the dominant force in your life, and that in turn will cause the things of this world to supersede in importance the things of God in your life, then it's only a matter of time before the seeds of destruction will blossom in your life. And that principle is revealed to us in the 16th chapter of Proverbs and the 18th verse. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Believe it or not, the pride of life can cause you to fall far more easily than the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eye. Because pride is very subtle. It will move slowly, and if you are not watchful and careful, you will begin to make excuses for the things you allow to come into your life. They will come and remain there, even though you know that God is displeased with it. And the Apostle Paul warns us about these subtle characteristics that will seep into our life if we are not prayerful and on guard to prevent them from penetrating into our spiritual consciousness. For in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, in the first through the fifth verses, we are told, you should, also know, you should also know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and have no interest in what is good. They will betray their friends. Be reckless. Be puffed up with pride and love pleasure more than God. They will act as if they are religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. You must stay away from people like that. These are people who have fallen victim to the pride of life. These people get so wrapped up in their own selves, their own ideals and their own feelings, that they fail to seek the guidance and direction of God that is found in the Bible. For God's will is quite different than your will, your wants, feelings, and desires. For the Bible clearly lets us know that your thoughts are not God's thoughts. Your own ideals will lead you astray, for you can easily be led astray and convince yourself that you are right. If you listen to your own heart without studying the Word of God. For in the 14th chapter of Proverbs, in the 12th verse, we are told, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Now, there's a spiritual entity whose name is 